So I'm going to, this is talk, it's going to be really in two parts. I'm going to give you production, and then my uh, colleague Pujan is going to come and talk about the, the more interesting function programming aspects of it. So I'm going to start by giving you an introduction to what we're doing in computational science, and in particular, topological analysis of data sets. Now, an applic the application that we've been working on is part of a larger project, a uk funded project called META, looking at multiple topology, where we've been taking data on simulations of nuclear scission. That's been done by one of our collaborators on that project at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the US, and using that data to try and identify where interesting things happen within these simulations. So I'm not going to be able to go into all the background, uh, either of the science or of the analysis in the talk. If you're interested in further information, the, the foundations, the mathematics of, of multi-field topology and the algorithm that we used was reported uh, earlier this year. And the actual case study of, of using this on the uh, fission data sets uh, was reported back at, in, in Visualization 2012. So both those references are in the paper. So what we do in computational science typically is we're studying physical systems. So we're studying either computer simulations or measurements that are taken of some phenomena that's assumed to be continuous. So we, we have discrete samples within some space. So over in this example here, I've got a very small number of samples. I've got nine samples that in this case have been uh, taken on the most simplest scenario where we have a regular grid. Samples are placed at regular intervals and that has implications for how we can store the data. Now, because we've got discrete samples of a phenomenon that's assumed to be continuous, we often want to interpolate between those samples. And to do interpolation, we have to apply some kind of scheme. So what we usually do is to take the underlying spatial domain and subdivide it in some way. Now, there's different ways you can subdivide it. For topological analysis, what we usually do is assume that we have a simplicial subdivision into local regions. So we're in one of these regions here where we have these discrete samples. We can ask, well, what's the value of this whatever we measured at that point in space. Now, of course, if you have set samples of some phenomena, you want to understand the phenomena. So what scientists are typically interested in, if you have something like a scalar field, where we have a single value at each point in space, is, well, where are the minima? Where are the maxima? Where are the saddle points? And the points in the space where the function can go both uphill or downhill. So a classic way of finding that information is to, is to look at the, uh, what are called the contours. So if you imagine that this is a height field where these values represent the height above surface, then what you typically do is look at contour lines. You take a value in the field, in the range, which is height above sea level, for example, and say, well, let's, let's use interpolation to project, uh, work out what, where in the, func in the domain uh, the function takes on that value. So you, in this case, you may have uh, multiple, comp multiple disconnected components where you have that value, you have 3.5 over here, you have a value of 3.5 uh, running somewhere somewhere over there. So there's a whole mathematics underlying this. It's, it's level sets, it's, it's generating contour lines. Or if you go to higher dimensional data, if you go to three-dimensional data, we call these things uh, surfaces or isosurfaces, and you can go, go higher dimensional if you want to. We're taking a slightly different view uh, of, how, of how we do this uh, for a reason I'll come to in a moment. What we're thinking about is thinking about not the, uh, a single value, but an interval. So we think about uh, where uh, can we round off the uh, value of the function to within some interval. So here, for example, this is the interval between 3.5 and 4.5. So we treat this region here as an equivalence region. Uh, if you think about as you, as you decrease the size of the region, you come to, come to a better approximation of a single ISO line. So if we, if we fragment the domain into these intervals where the function takes on a value within a given range, we can then look at the adjacency relationship between uh, these regions of equivalent behavior, and we can draw it as a tree. And in, in computational topology, that's called a contour tree, and it's very interesting because it gives you a nice, very abstract view of what's going on in this data, and what it points out straight away is that you've got two maxima, two minima, and one saddle point. That, that's great. The problem is, people have known for, in, in since the 1940s when Morse did the fundamental work and in the last 20 years how to compute interesting properties of scalar fields, but scientists rarely re ever study fields in isolation. We're typically working with multi-fields where we have multiple kinds of data that we're studying at one point in time. And until recently, nobody had a mathematics or a computational model for studying multi-field interactions. And that's what we've been working on uh, within the meta, broader meta project um, 
if we take one field like we've just seen and it's and it's contour tree and then we can't take a second field what happens when those fields interact well what we do is we take these slab regions that we generate for the individual fields we intersect the slab regions we take the dual uh, we take the connectivity graph based on adjacency between regions of equivalent behavior and the thing that we get out this graph with white nodes and black edges is what we call joint contour net and again, I don't want to go into details. If you label the nodes in this graph and you project them, you can collapse them down either to that tree or to that tree. It's a, it's a real generalization. So what kind, of a, what kind of problem might we want to uh, study with this? Well, let's take nuclear fission. In, in the early days of, of uh, nuclear science, physicists worked with highly empirical qualitative models of fission. So uh, Bohr's, if you go to one of Bohr's papers, you'll see drawings like that which is uh, a water drop analogy for the nucleus. The idea is that the nucleus comes under some kind of tension and when fission takes place, it breaks apart. Of course, physicists today work with much more sophisticated models. They're working with models which are based uh, in quantum mechanics. The, the current uh, top runner is something called density functional theory. Do you, please don't ask me about it. It makes my head hurt. Um, but what they do is they, they take a very high dimensional space, 40 or 50 dimensions of different uh, quantum properties. So here we've got two quantum <coughs> properties, quadrupole moment, moment and hexadecapole moment, whatever those mean. Um, they look at combinations of these properties and then within this uh, high dimensional field, they calculate the energy that's within the nuclear system. So you then get a, an energy landscape like this. Uh, what the physicists want to do then is look at the valleys within this energy landscape and if you take a profile along a valley you get a, a, a diagram, something like that, which shows you the energy as you step along that valley. And what they of course want to see is where there's a big drop of energy because if a nucleus loses energy, it indicates that it's broken into fragments. So in this case here, along this particular valley, you've got a pretty good idea that fission took place. What about this one? Very, very hard to spot. They, you, it's very difficult to quantify uh, where, where fission is happening. So they want alternative ways of understanding this. So one thing they can do is to take these points along these pathways and realize this, take a realize, physical realization where they produce a three-dimensional density field which says if you take a, a regional space around a nucleus, what's the probability of finding a proton and what's the probability of finding a neutron within that uh, point in, in that space? So then the question can be recast as a topological one. If you take these density fields, at what point is the topological structure of that space compatible with having two nuclear fragments, two or more nuclear fragments? And that's where the joint quantum net comes in. So if we take, the, uh, take a data set, a 3D realization of one of these physical systems, we can apply the joint quantum net algorithm, and then what we end up with is a very pretty picture that looks like that after we've done graph drawing on it. And so um, each node here is one of those fragments within the topology and uh, using the FMM layout here we get a, a nice picture and what it shows you, you can interpret this back to the physical system, is this region corresponds to the, to the uh, boundary of the domain. Uh, we have these various shells which represent it, it, the shells of increasing density and we can point to where the, where the nuclear fragments occur. This, this funny starburst effect is actually quite important and interesting it's a, it's a result of the way that the fields are, are interacting very closely, and there's more details than that uh, in, in the, this 12 paper, and I'm happy to show you. But the net result is we can run this approach on streams of data, and we can get out diagrams like that, and then we can inspect the diagrams. And in this case, we've got a single nuclear fragment here. We've got two nuclear fragments up here, so we can use that to pinpoint where fission is taking place. So... Um, as I said, this was part of a larger project. Meta project isn't using functional programming. We're doing uh, development work in what are the standard tools in scientific visualization, C++, the visualization toolkit, BTK. We threw together a C++ implementation of the uh, multi-field analysis as a proof of concept. We struck lucky. We've got this data. We were able to really make, show impact uh, on, on the physicists. I'll come to that later. And it was quite sufficient for working with what are really, by scientific standards, very small data sets, FM and PU, the order of 60 cubed volumes. Um, however, we want to be more ambitious in the future, and we wanted to, re first of all, rewrite the code so it works via three dimensions, not just two or three dimensions. 
We have 4D dimensions if you bring in time. If you deal with parameter spaces, you can go up to any number of dimensions. So we rewrote the code sequentially um, uh, in Haskell. And the Haskell implementation actually helped us to uh, really pin down the uh, algorithm for working with in arbitrary dimensional spaces. And it guided what we did in the second C++ analysis. But what we were, um, what we were presently surprised by is that for reasonably coarse granu granulations of the input domain, our runtime performance was actually quite good compared to the C++. It was only when we got finer and finer, we, we, got, we fragmented the domain into uh, better and better approximations to a uh, discrete topology that suddenly the Haskell performance started to degrade, and that was largely because uh, we were getting uh, big memory, suddenly using very large chunks of memory. So we thought, well, okay, this is really fun stuff. Uh, maybe we can even get ahead of where we are with C++ and push this, push this parallel. So uh, traditionally, computational topology is, is a nasty, stubbornly serial problem. It's been very hard to get parallel implementations. This JCN algorithm is actually embarrassingly parallel. We can start off with a special domain. We can partition it. We can compute the JCN of the individual partitions. And then by carrying along some boundary information about how fragments uh, how those fragments intersect the line on, on the boundary, we can do a merge step and we can come out with a fused JCN. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Fujian, who's going to tell you about the, the work we've done to date on parallelizing that. So for parallel evaluation of joint counter net, we all are a different approaches that we have implemented are based on the same approach, dividing the data set, computing the joint counter net, and then merging them. We have so far implemented four skeletons, divide and conquer, map, eager, and pipeline. Today I'm not going to talk about the map, but the details are available in the paper. To implement these uh, four skeletons, we have used Parmonad library, which is one of the parallel programming models for shared memory architecture in the Haskell. It has a simple interface as the uh, data of type definition, and there are two functions. Runpar, which uh, receives a pair computation as its arguments and return a uh, uh, pure results and the uh, fork function, which actually creates uh, parallel tasks. Uh, it receives a um, par uh, computation as its arguments, create a child task, and uh, perform that task in parallel. Uh, to communicate data between um, processes, and uh, between parent or child processes, we can use IVAR uh, a structure. It's IVAR is the location in memory that you can. Uh, write into it once using the pair, uh, using the put function, and you can read from it using the get function. Uh, the get function is actually a blocking operation. So our first uh, skeleton was a straightforward implementation of divide and conquer. Uh, the original uh, problem, original data sets, is recursively divided into uh, two subsets uh, until the, 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 the subset is small enough. Uh, and then the tasks in the width of the tree compute the joint counter nets and send the results back to their parents. Uh, the, intern the internal node, internal nodes merge the uh, joint counter nets of their two children and send the results back toward the uh, root of the tree. Sorry. So here is the code in uh, Haskell. It's well, the problem is uh, split into two sub-problems. Here, two sub-problems are uh, two parts of two tasks are slumped to compute uh, joint counter nets for uh, these uh, sub-problems. And here, the problem waits uh, till the results are available and then merge them. The next skeleton uses a bottom-up approach. So instead of getting the original problem and dividing it, here we divide the um, data set into a stream of uh, subsets, um, create tasks to compute joint counter net for each uh, sub, uh, subset, and also we create a merger task uh, that merge joint counter nets in a binary uh, merge scheme. Here is a simple example. Uh, we have the stream of sub problems. For the first pair, we divide two tasks are created to compute joint counter nets. A further merge task is created that waits for the result of these two joint counter nets. And uh, for the next sub-problem, the same tasks are created. 
And also now we, 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 we can create another merge task to, uh, to get the results of these two merger uh, and create a higher level uh, uh, for a bigger data set, the joint counter net for a higher level for a bigger data set. The same strategy goes on uh, till we consume all, uh, the whole sub uh, stream of sub problems. This, uh, this skeleton was uh, consuming the stream very quickly, creating all these uh, tasks, the uh, joint internet computation and merger tasks, uh, very quickly in the beginning of the uh, process. So we thought that this was, uh, our analysis shows that it was too eager. So we decided to extend it with the rate limiting mechanism. Uh, this skeleton was, is a little bit more complicated, but we can explain it as a three-stage uh, pipeline, where the first stage creates a stream of sub-problems, the second stage creates a uh, task to compute joint counter net uh, for each subset. But it has a limited um, capacity. And so when there, there are no more uh, tasks available, the first uh, uh, three tasks available, uh, the first uh, stage stops sending more soft problems. As soon as the first joint counter net uh, is computed, the result is sent to the third stage uh, for magic. Uh, and also the first stage uh, starts sending uh, more soft uh, problems. The merger uh, stage use a uh, binary merger scheme, very much similar to EGS skeleton. Here is the uh, comparison of the performance of these different skeletons. The top uh, plot shows the speed up, uh, and uh, this one is the total memory allocation. Uh, for different slab bits, this is the maximum residency. Uh, looking at these uh, plots, you can see that divide and conquer is always giving us the best uh, speed up and the lowest total memory allocation. The EGAN uh, pipeline uh, skeletons uh, have similar speed up uh, and uh, total memory allocation. But looking at the maximum residency, you can see that the pipeline uh, has the lowest maximum residency and for many applications, uh, especially in the scientific uh, computation, that the memory becomes a bottleneck can be another uh, alternative. Could you please read out the labels because here in the back I can't oh, read it. So th this is the speed up for this. Which color is oh, okay. uh, The pink one is uh, divide and conquer. The blue is eager. Uh, green is pipeline. And the red one is map. So they are uh, speed up for different slap bits. So just to wrap up, um, what we've done within the work is that uh, the, the sequential Haskell that we wrote helped. Well, it wasn't essential to doing the science, but it helped us to do the science. So it's indirectly uh, helped us to solve what was an urban problem in nuclear physics. And in fact, the uh, analysis that we subsequently did on the second round of data sets that we were able to do once we had more confidence and our collaborators had more confidence in the technique has actually triggered further research and fission. So we've currently got two papers going through Physics Review C, which are reporting those new, reporting those new results. We're still having, uh, a, our physicists are having a, a debate with, some of the re with, the, with the reviewers on, on that, but we're quite hopeful this will uh, be through later this year. And then the, the, the S&P work that Fujian just talked about is really allowing us to try and leapfrog the imperative work. And the, the implementation, the, the JCN is an embarrassing parallel problem. It should be straightforward to implement uh, give on, on any uh, uh, parallel platform. But we actually, uh, our experience is working with Haskell it is a much easier, much more pleasant route to doing that experimentation. And we, we may later translate that back into a, into a more mainstream architecture. So I mentioned that our data sets are very small. The people that we collaborate with, Lawrence Berkeley, are working with 
very much larger data, data out in the scale of pe petabytes. Of course, they're doing that on distributed memory power uh, machines, things like uh, the DOE's Titan Cray uh, in, uh, in Berkeley. So we started to explore uh, how we can uh, take some of the strategies and distribute our computation on a, on a uh, distributed memory platform. We're currently looking a little bit into, into using Eden, which is a uh, version of distributed uh, parallel Haskell. And of course, we also want to compare the uh, ease of development and performance that we get with a, a, a scientific uh, parallel toolkit, probably something like uh, UIUC's Charm. We're also looking at encoding this onto GPU via CUDA. Uh, there's a nice uh, library for doing CUDA programming as part of the, VT, the main VTK part system that we, that we use. Uh, we can do that. The difficult complexity is that uh, the, this pro problem of fragmenting these what may be arbitrary dimensional polytopes down isn't really a, a nice data parallel problem. It introduces amorphous data parallelism. We're having to do some very, very nasty encoding of the structures uh, into, into flattened arrays is exactly the kind of work you need. You want a, a, a nice sort of Haskell library like Accelerate or some of the work that uh, was in the previous talk to, to, uh, to help with. But more broadly, just to wrap up, um, using Haskell for computational science is great, but it's very unclear how you go much further than that. The, the uh, computational science community is very deeply wedded to imperative technologies. And if you look at, for example, the uh, technology roadmap coming at places like uh, LLNC or the technologies that are on the radar for things like the US Extreme Scale Computing Agenda, even on the more ex uh, speculative side of those programs, nobody's really looking at, 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 at FP of any flavor. Mm -hmm. There is functional ideas starting to permeate into toolkits, but it's at a very much lower level. How do you take ideas like for example, like uh, fusion or traversals, and implement them within C++ libraries. So some neat work like Evil and, and the DAX toolkit that do that. Equally, the, the other problem is you can go to a, you know, one of our collaborators and say, it would be great to implement this in Haskell and have it you know, running as in for, your, for your data. But what happens in you know, three or four years' time when they want to run it again and you know, maybe we're not available? You, you need to have a supply of trained people, and the people in the, in the lab systems have largely come through uh, uh, training in imperative languages, parallel Fortran, parallel uh, different parallel libraries for, for C, and, and so on. You, unless people have a reliable pipeline of people with the right set of skills, no one is going to make that investment. So it's a chicken and egg problem. You need to make a breakthrough in order to get people started, uh, convinced to use these tools. But you're not going to make the breakthrough unless you can find what's the key selling point, and that where's the payoff. And I, I, I think one of the things that we've really got to study in, in the future is trying to quantify what is the cost-benefit analysis. How much uh, cost do we save by doing this development in Haskell? Languages like Haskell or Scala or whatever. And what is the, you know, what's the cost? If we save, if we run at maybe 75% of the speed of uh, a uh, finely tuned imperative implementation but can generate the code in 20% of the time, does that justify actually making an investment in the technology? That, that's a hard question for the future, but it's one I'd really like to be able to solve. And uh, that concludes our talk, so thank you for We have a few minutes for questions, please. Wilson. Yeah, so can you elaborate on what steps did you take to optimize the sequential part of your Haskell code? Uh, we've been using Fredscope largely to uh, look at overall and, and standard GHC profiling tools. Uh, within the, I'm just trying to think back to within the sequential code, what, what any particular tricks that we used. Um, I mean, we looked at the da data, op the, the layout of the data. Uh, we tried to do a bit of encoding of the of the of the arrays. Uh, we used switched to using, for example, using the ST monad uh, for. Building up the graph, the, the constructing the graph is a pain. It's, it's not. It's something that you invariably need. Something like a adjacency in this representation index by with uh, integer indices rather than a, a, a nice recursive functional data structure to do that. What about things like stream fusion, for example? Um, the uh, the 
imperative implementation does do have a little bit of stream fusion because we break down the second stage into a, it does break, nicely break down into a pipeline. I'm, I couldn't guarantee that we've got getting fusion coming down at all points in that. One of the things that we'd like to do is we run, there's a, there was a recent tool posted across hack, uh, uh, from the hackage that checks for the presence of stream fusion. So we need to have a look and see whether we're actually achieving that in all places where we might. Um, what's a typical problem size and how much memory does it use and how long does it take to run? Well, in, in this case here, in, in, the, in the data sets that we've been working on here, um, the problem size is really quite modest. Uh, let's see where's the performance. Uh, so the, the, the data sets we have at the moment for this fusion are, are 60 by 60 by 60. Mm. So very, very small by scientific terms. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, we currently working on, for example, uh, on the meta project on Hurricane Isabel data sets, which are, I think, about 512 by 512 by 128, <coughs> and then you've got a whole stream of these things. Uh, we liked, you know, we had data sets, for example, from uh, elsewhere in, in my school, which are 100,000 by 100,000 mm -hmm. by 500, which are medical volumes. So we, we really want to be able to reach that kind of scale. We really want to be able to actually operate on the pedascale ultimately and be able to put these things running on a, on a, on a very large cluster or crate. So I just, have a, I just have a small comment. I think it is exceptionally cool that you have managed to solve open problems in physics using, uh, by thinking functionally about a, a computational aspect. Well, that thanks. Um, we, we, we had that feeling, but we can't unfortunately know that the functional programming helped yeah, yeah, we would have yeah, yeah. got there anyway without it. But oh, it yeah, yeah, but still, I mean, it kept us safe. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. So one issue that I've seen come up from my colleagues in biophysics is that the more computational the science gets, the more drive there is for disclosure of source code, and particularly for verification their algorithms are correct. And lots of research code is, as I'm sure you know, very ad hoc and not very well verified. Do you think that Static types and readability are strong arguments for moving toward FP in scientific computing. When, if there's a stronger request to disclose the actual source code that you use to to generate results. Well, for the answer is possibly. I mean, one thing I'd like comment on is the is the visual, all the visualization stuff that we use is already open source. It's produced mm -hmm. by a company called Kitware in the US. Mm -hmm. All the code is open source, and it, that's I, I think that's contributed to its to its success. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, a harder question is whether stat things like the the rich type system help and. Mm -hmm. You know, one argument is actually it may not, because what some of the, the really harder problems have to do with things like floating point accuracy, I think, and the approximations that are taking place in the algorithm. Where the type system might really pay off is the ability to do some of the nice optimization tricks, fusion and uh, you know, automatically coming up with the right kind of memory layout. And I think that's really cool, mm -hmm. uh, an opportunity to do that. Well, I'm talking about a common complaint that people who do scientific computing have when they look at some languages is they expect certain toolkits to be there especially if you're used to Fortran or even more modern, you know, NumPy or SciPy. Is there anything you felt that was missing that really ought to be created by a skilled Haskell programmer as opposed to necessarily scientists or some collaboration thereof that would encourage people to use this for scientific computing? Well, again, in our case, because the work that we do is primarily at the, visual, at the, at the analysis, at the back end, the so visualization you know, side, it's the graphics. Okay. I mean, in the previous project, um, Malcolm, uh, Malcolm Wallace mm. uh, played a big role in, uh, we actually did uh, Wrote a uh, uh, Haskell graphic graphical front end for doing the rendering and that, mm -hmm. but it's you know if you consider the number of, of uh, person years of work that have gone into the existing graphical front ends and tools, there is a huge gulf to bridge if you really want to push that through. And there's some already some nice you know, some nice tools out there on 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 package. And if we had the time to develop those up, I would really want to try and build a, a nice interactive front end onto what we do and and do put more of the pipeline into Haskell, but uh, it's going to take time to do that in people. I am. Uh, oh, oh, just a small comment. Uh, beautiful, beautiful work. Uh, I've seen that uh, in, in physics, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, let's say, build in performance, what have been already there for like 30 years, or really going to 30 years, right? Uh, to be improved. Uh, it would be great to be possible to have, say, a Haskell bridge to perform that work. Well, it's a way to like hook people in. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think that's part of the bigger picture. To, to following on on the previous question, I mean, again, you know, one of the things that we, we have shown in the previous work, 
is that we, we can actually match, and actually some, uh, we had a, a case back in 2006 when Malcolm uh, was able to optimize the Haskell code sufficiently to beat what was then the, the best C implementation. Uh, but you know, part of getting this translation from research into practice is going to be interfacing into, uh, you know, into the existing toolkits and uh, you know, be, even better yet, have the raw Haskell performance through optimization that you know, we're then competitive and we don't even want to bother doing that. Well, we are a little over time, but we are having a 15 minute break now. So let's thank our speaker one more time.